let's do that. Let's do that. Today we're going to be in John 14. John 14. And I don't, I don't usually tell you what the titles are for these sermons, but the title today for our second message from John 14 is this, uh, The Cure for a Troubled Heart, Part 2. <laughs> and the reason why we are in Part 2 today is because Part 1 was last week, right? This whole chapter, all of John 14, begins and ends with Jesus telling his disciples to let not their hearts be troubled. And through the chapter, Jesus gives them several reasons why they could take heart, why they could be encouraged and confident as he was preparing uh, to leave them. So guess what the title for next week's sermon is going to be? Lord willing, The Cure for a Troubled Heart, Part 3. Okay? And if we can't finish the chapter next week, there'll be maybe Part 4. Okay? But you get the idea. And because this chapter is a steady progression, though, from one thought to the next, and, and most often one thought building off of what came before it, it's kind of hard to know where to stop and start uh, for each Sunday. I, I've changed the schedule about five times already, even in the last two weeks. But it, was al- it would also be hard to, to get started where we left off last week without a little review. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start reading in verse 1. And when we get through to verse 6, we'll have gotten to where we left off last Sunday, okay? So let's look at John 14, starting in verse 1, where Jesus is speaking to the 11 disciples, 11 of the 12 in the upper room. Remember, Judas has already left and betrayed Christ. He's betraying Christ that night. Uh, this is the night when Jesus will be arrested. The next day, Jesus will be crucified. He has told the disciples that he's about to leave them, and they cannot come, and they're struggling with this. So Jesus says this in John 14, verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So how are the disciples going to counter their distress? How are they going to overcome their anxiety, their despair? Belief. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And then remember, Jesus begins to unpack what that belief includes. If the disciples were going to be comforted in the midst of what they were about to experience the next 24 hours, uh, what kinds of information would be helpful? For starters, Jesus continues, verse 2, In my Father's house are many rooms, permanent dwelling places. If it were not so... What I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. Remember, heaven is uh, wonderful because Jesus is there, and we are with him forever. He says that where I am, you may also be, and you know the way to where I'm going, he says, except they didn't think they knew. He says, you know the way to where I'm going, but they didn't think they knew. They did know the way, but they didn't know they knew. You know what I mean? And so Thomas got brave and asked, verse 5. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so last Sunday, concerning uh, verse 6, I shared some thoughts concerning the exclusivity of the gospel. The exclusivity of the gospel, that Christ is the way, the truth, the life. And remember, that exclusivity is not, we are an exclusive country club, like only we deserve this kind of a thing. It is inclusive in that everybody needs saved, and the offer of the gospel is given to all. It is exclusive in that there is only one way of salvation the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, putting our faith and trust in him alone, by grace, through faith in Christ alone. So this answered uh, the part of Thomas' question concerning the way to where Jesus was going, but there's another part to Thomas' question, which is in line with Jesus' prior statement. Remember, Jesus was not only speaking about the way, but also the where. The where. Jesus is the way to the Father. No one comes to the Father except through me, he said. And Jesus now transitions the conversation to this relationship. God the Son and God the Father. And then before we're done this morning, God the Spirit as well. We're going to see in this passage the three persons of the triune Godhead uh, along with the disciples as Jesus teaches them. And they're not going to understand it all. And we'll do our best. Okay, so verse 7. Verse 7. If you had known me, 
you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Uh, the disciples have evidenced, and, and Jesus has confirmed that they were struggling to really understand exactly what's going on. And even though Peter was right in identifying Jesus as the Christ, the son of the living God in Matthew 16, there was still room to grow. And Jesus is going to teach them a little more here on, on just how united the Father and the Son are, uh, the essence they share. And we might ask the question, what exactly does Jesus mean when he says, from now on? From now on, you do know him and have seen him, the Father. It, it can't be that immediate moment. Because look at Philip's request in verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. Uh, so they definitely don't get it right then and there. They don't get it right then and there. Uh, Jesus just said, you have seen him, the Father. And that have seen is a past tense way of saying that, right? And Philip asks, show us the Father. It's almost as if Philip is expecting the Moses-like uh, Mount Sinai experience. Or even more so, to literally see the face of God. Moses didn't get that. It's kind of interesting to me that, that Philip would make this request when you think about what men in the Old Testament like Jacob or Gideon or Samson's father, Manoah, would say when they perceived that they had seen the Lord. Remember? They'd freak out. They thought, oh my goodness, I'm going to die. I just saw God face to face. They thought they were going to die, or when they had realized they had seen him, they were relieved that they hadn't died. And now Philip is asking to see the Father? But Philip had already seen God. He was looking at him. <laughs> and he'd seen God every day for the last three years or so, in fact. Uh, back in chapter 1, John 1, 1 through 3, remember John writes this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not anything was made that was made. And then verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So by the time John writes this gospel, inspired by the Spirit, of course, this book of the Bible, by then he gets it. In the upper room, it seems the light bulb hasn't quite turned on yet. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? We've been together every day for three years and, and you still don't understand. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe, verse 11, believe, here's this word again. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. And there are three, three things that I want us to, uh, to think about concerning these verses. Three things to think about. First, what is the content of the belief here? What is the content of the belief? What was Philip and what are we supposed to believe? And in short, what we're to know and believe is this. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. I am in the Father and the Father is in me, Jesus said to his disciples. There is a unity of God the Father and God the Son. I am in the Father, the Father is in me, sharing the same essence and yet distinct persons. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. The Father is God. The Son is God. Uh, Jesus is teaching here and will continue to teach in the verses ahead about the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, the Athanasian Creed says it this way, we worship one God in Trinity. And Trinity in unity neither confounding the persons, not uniting as if they are just one person, not confounding the persons, nor dividing the substance or the essence, depending on what uh, English translation of the creed you see. We worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons, nor dividing the essence or the substance. Uh, MacArthur and Mayhew's uh, biblical doctrine says it this way, each person of the Trinity, also known as the Godhead, 
possesses the entire, simple, undivided essence of God. This fact means that the three persons, though distinct from one another, are co-equal in every perfection of the divine essence. Make sense? Y'all got the Trinity all perfectly figured it out now? Okay. <laughs> Moving on. So, Jesus is teaching the disciples that he is in the Father and the Father is in him. They and we are to understand that Jesus is the very essence of God. Second, uh, the evidence for their belief. The evidence for that belief. What had Jesus done that only God could do? And besides things like turning water into wine or feeding thousands with a few loaves and some fishies, besides walking on water or commanding the storm-tossed sea to be still, I thought of two other particular miracles because of what was said and done about them, in them, after them. A, a bit of evidence of their greatness and the truth people were called to understand, the truth that people were called to understand as a result of what they had seen. So how about the healing of the man who was born blind? In John chapter 9, verse 32, this was the observation after the miracle was done. It said, uh, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. And then you might remember that, that that formerly blind man, he also gained his spiritual sight that day. And he worshipped Jesus. He worshipped Jesus. A something that no normal man deserves. Only God deserves worship. And Jesus received that worship that day. And rightly so. And the disciples would have known that that happened. And then, of course, many of us probably would think of the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. In John 11, verse 37, and this verse ties together the previous miracle from this one, uh, and clues us into the thoughts of those gathered here. The people said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? And even Jesus himself, before commanding Lazarus to get up and come out of that grave, he said this to Martha in verse 40, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God. In John 5, 36, Jesus said this, uh, but the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I'm doing, bear witness about me. They bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And then John 10, 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. And then now in John 14, there in the upper room, Jesus is reminding his disciples, these works that you've seen me do, they confirmed who sent me, and they have confirmed who I am. I am God the Son. The Father is in me, and I am in the Father. So that's what they're to believe. Third, what is the benefit of the belief? What's the benefit? Why? So what? Uh, do you remember what Jesus began this chapter with? Let not your hearts be troubled. Belief. Jesus is sharing this information with the disciples to bring them comfort in a very confusing, troubling time. He is speaking the truth to them. He's not trying to distract. He's not trying to, uh, you know, give them some candy to get them off of the subject. He's speaking the truth to them to give them true comfort and hope, strength to press forward. And the question then that we need to ask is this. What is the truth that Jesus is speaking to them to give them that comfort? And remember now, what has Jesus told them about himself? He says, I am God. Jesus is God. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth, Psalm 46, 10. How is that for comfort? This is who he is. It's as if the disciples were saying, but Jesus, you can't do this. You can't do that. How will we make it? How will you succeed? And Jesus responds, you might say today in a simple, guys, guys, <laughs> listen, 
I'm God. No worries. I'm God. Let not your hearts be troubled. Verse 12. He then says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. It's clear that the apostles uh, did do some works in the, in the same nature or in the supernatural nature of the miracles that Jesus did. Like in Acts 9, where Peter says to the man named uh, Aeneas, who had been bedridden for eight years, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And that guy got up and he made his bed. And so the apostles did do miracle type works like Jesus had done. But they didn't do any miracles per se. Uh, the kind of works that we might think of as these sort of miracles that would have been considered greater than the miracles that Jesus did. Does that make sense? So if we're just thinking in, this, in the sense of physical miracles, do we see in Scripture the, the disciples doing or the apostles doing greater miracles than Jesus did? Additional miracles, yes. Greater? So what did Jesus mean when he said that greater works would be done? And this is a tough question, by the way. Many godly people, godly Bible scholars have been scratching their heads on this passage. But the last part of verse 12, I think, is a key. And so do most of the commentary writers that I read this week, okay? So this isn't just me thinking this, and I've got it figured out, nobody else knows, okay? But, but what does it say there in verse 12? Greater works than these will he do. Why? Because I am going to the Father. Meaning, this greater work is a work that the disciples were not seeing happen so much uh, before Jesus left them but they would after. Something that's not happened a ton before, but it's going to happen after. And remember in Luke 10, Jesus sent the disciples out, uh, uh, over 70, and, and told them to go into towns and heal the sick. And so miracles like healing people, they've already done that stuff. Jesus is looking at a work and talking of a work, I think, that is greater than those kinds of miracles. And so the question is, what greater work will be done through the apostles uh, first and then through everyone who believes in Jesus after he leaves. Can you think of a time during Jesus' earthly ministry where 3,000 souls were converted, brought from death to life? I can remember a bunch of times where there were a bunch of healings and miracles and a bunch of people eating food and wanting more of that. And I can remember parts in the Gospel of John where, where Jesus knew what was the heart of man and didn't entrust himself to them. But this is different. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes. And he begins the work in Jesus' name of gathering together the church. Christ promised, I will build my church. And the church is built through the miracle of conversions. Conversions. A spiritually dead people hearing about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, believing in him alone for the forgiveness of their sin, calling on the name of the Lord to be saved. What a miracle. That's a miracle. And then unlike during the earthly ministry of Christ, the gospel goes far beyond the nation of Israel to the Gentiles, even to the ends of the earth. And people from every tribe, tongue, and nation will hear the word of God and be saved. Greater works than these he will do because he's going to the Father. And church, we get to be a part of that greater work. <laughs> we are the result of it, praise God, and we get to see it go further as we uh, cooperate with God in fulfilling the Great Commission. And with that in mind, that kind of mindset on, on the greatest miracle of God, the conversion of these lost souls, of our lost souls, Passing from death to life, I think now we're ready for verses 13 and 14. Because these certainly have been taken out of context. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Context is really important here, isn't it? If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. You might think, okay, right? We know where this is going, right? So as long as I say... In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Ah, now I can get anything I want. 
we know this is not the case. You know, you think about, well, fancy cars and lots of money. I am finally going to get signed to play for the Tigers. I don't know what they've been waiting on so long. I'm as old as uh, Miguel Cabrera. I lost all of the non-baseball fans out there. Sorry, I'll bring you back. But, man, the clock is ticking. He's, he needs to retire, and I'm as old as him, so they better get on that fast, right? Or how about in our younger years, getting those straight A's in school, even though maybe we haven't studied or done any of the homework? A miracle. <laughs> is that what Jesus means when he says, ask me anything and I'll do it? We know that's not what that means. When we ask in Jesus' name, what are we doing? What are we doing? And I think this, uh, Jesus answers this question right here in verse 13, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. James 4.3 speaks of those kinds of prayers that we're just joking about. Uh, James 4.3 says this, You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. And how? To spend it on your passions. And that's often right when we, when we do that, ask on our passions, and then God doesn't give us what that might be, then we think, well, now I can be angry with God because he didn't fulfill what he promised to do, it, and that vicious cycle starts, doesn't it? When we're trying to use Jesus as a genie in a magic lamp who has to grant our wishes, there's, first of all, there's an exchange there of glory, isn't there? Who's God now? There's an exchange there. I think it's, it's safe to say that we're misunderstanding and misusing this promise that Christ will do anything we ask. Uh, we cannot use Jesus' name to accomplish things for our name, for our own vainglory. Uh, that would be manipulation of power for personal gain. It wouldn't be love, which comes up in verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Again, context is important. Do you see here? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Do you see how verse 15 further defines the verses 13 and 14? When we put all these things together, it shapes our understanding of what each verse, each clause of every sentence means. Uh, please understand, though, the scripture does invite us to cast our cares on him because he cares for us. We can go too far with this and say, only pray for things that God has expressly said in, in the word. <laughs> That'd be way too far of a whiplash, Right? We are given encouragement in Scripture, command in Scripture to cast our cares on him. We're encouraged in the midst of our anxieties. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. So it wouldn't be right to do that whiplash uh, so hard on the misuse of these verses in John 14 to make out some sort of application that says, we can't pray for anything except the furtherance of gospel and the expansion of the church though we ought to pray for that. But that would make it impossible to obey other exhortations to pray, and even things we can pray for. God invites us to pray, which in and of itself is a sweet thing, isn't it? Even for our daily bread, our daily needs. And when we do pray for these things, for the physical well-being of our loved ones, for the spiritual growth of our brothers and sisters in Christ, for the salvation of the lost, and, and more and more and more things, we can pray for these things in love. We can pray for these things to the glory of God, and we can pray with eager expectation. Not in a, if you have enough faith, God will grant it kind of a way. That's not it. But in a, if this is to God's glory and according to his will, he's going to do it. God invites us to pray, and he already knows our hearts. Ask, ask, and as you grow in love for him and love for your neighbor, as you mature as a Christian, watch your prayers and your actions increasingly conform to the image of Christ in Jesus' name. Now, Jesus introduces another reason for comfort in verse 16. Uh, the coming Spirit of God. Verse 16, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another, meaning of the same kind, another helper, uh, to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. In these last verses from John 14 that we will uh, look at today, we see the Holy Spirit. And he's called in this passage the Spirit of truth. 
the spirit of truth. Remember, Jesus is the way and the truth. So if Jesus is the truth and the spirit is the spirit of truth, you see the connection there being given? A sharing of that same substance, that same essence. And furthermore, it's interesting and helpful to know that there are two Greek words for another. Two words that can be translated to the English word another. And one of them, uh, one of those terms means a different kind. So another mean, meaning a different another. And that word is the word we, uh, heteros in the Greek. The word we get the prefix hetero. Okay, and it means different. So we understand that, uh, where we get that, what that means. But this is not the word that Jesus uses here in verse 16 when he called the Spirit another helper. Uh, the word Jesus used means not different, but the same. Of the same, meaning of the same nature, of the same essence. And the point I'm trying to make here is that Jesus is introducing the Spirit of God not as some lesser or different or inferior version of anything. He's not that, but he is the very essence of God. We see in today's passage, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit. And the disciples were being comforted. They were to be comforted. To receive comfort for their troubled hearts because even though they were about to lose this close fellowship and interaction with God, they were about to gain close fellowship and interaction with God. God the Son was leaving, God the Spirit's coming. And it's also neat to remember that the Holy Spirit is not the only helper or comforter. Perhaps even a better translation of the word, our advocate. Think of comforter, helper, advocate. The the word in the Greek is more like a defense attorney. That's what the word would refer to. Think of Jesus in Romans 8, starting in verse 33, it says this, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justified, who is to condemn. A prosecutor, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Christ serving as an advocate. 1 John 2, 1 says this, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So there isn't just one advocate for us in the New Testament. We have two. Jesus is our advocate, and the Holy Spirit is another advocate. Think back to Romans 8 again, starting in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Intercede. And he who searches hearts uh, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. According to the will of God. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. How about that? The Spirit prays in Jesus' name for us even when we don't know what to pray. Praise God. (laughs) So ask him. (laughs) Even Even if I mess up my prayer and say something all kinds of sideways and messed up, the Spirit is my advocate. And he prays for me in Jesus' name. I hope these scriptures encourage you too. Uh, In that, when we think of the Spirit as a comforter, You know, we might think of someone who pats us on the back after a sad, hard day. A little kiddo loses their loses their game or misses out on something, and they got a single tear going down their cheek, and we comfort them, right? We might think of a comforter like that. Uh, We might think of a helper, somebody who's able to lend a hand when we need a little extra assistance. We might think of helper or comforter in these lesser ways, but an advocate, someone who comes alongside to speak on our behalf, to speak in our defense, which is what the word in the Greek means. This is what we get the word paraclete for, coming alongside in our defense. The Spirit doesn't just console us after a hardship, though God certainly does know our every need and calls us to cast our cares on him, to weep with those who weep, but this role of the Spirit is not just to console believers after hardship, after a loss, a loss, 
More than that, the Spirit is given to us as strength for the fight. Marching to victory. That is what the Spirit does in and for us. The strength of God advocating for us. Christ says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe. I'm leaving you, Jesus says, but when I do, I'm going to send you God, the Spirit. You will not be left without the strength of God fighting on your behalf. Let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus Christ has gone to the cross and suffered the just wrath of God against our sin in our place. And all those who put their faith and trust in him alone are rescued, redeemed, saved. And Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us, and he's coming again to take us to himself and to the Father forever. Jesus is the only way. He is the truth. He is the life. And if you know and believe him, you will be together with him in glory eternally. That's on God's faithful word. And Jesus has evidenced himself as God, the Son. And greater works have been done and are being done as we see the church continue to expand. Why are people still being saved today? Why are we still filling the baptistry? Why is the Spirit breathing new life into people around the world 2,000 years after Christ taught his disciples these things? Because Jesus is God. That's why. And God the Spirit is at work. When God departed from this world, God came to be our advocate in the Spirit. God the Spirit is here. And he's in us. And he prays on our behalf. And he seals us. He marks us for eternity. And you say, but wait, there's more. That's next week. Okay? Let not your hearts be troubled believe. Let's pray together. Father, your word says uh, in the book of Ephesians that we have given, been given every spiritual blessing. We have been given immeasurable riches in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for all of the ways that you have revealed to us what these riches are, what these blessings are. Thank you for the spirit given to us to illumine our hearts and minds to the truth of the scripture. And Lord, to be humbled to remember that even as we consider these things, thinking about things like the Trinity, thinking about things like your sovereign grace, thinking about Uh, your promise to conform us, shape us into the image of Christ, to to be with you forever. No sin, no death, no sickness, only joy and righteousness. These are immeasurable riches. And Lord, we, we desire to do our best as we read your word and study it together to understand just how wonderful you are. And how wonderful and loving you have been to us. And Lord, we, we are right to acknowledge these things as uh, simply immeasurable. And God, I pray that as we continue to think through these things, continue to work through uh, Jesus' words to us in John 14, that our understanding of your greatness would only grow and expand. That our appreciation for you would only deepen. That our affections for you would become more and more rich, more sweet that we would increasingly delight to do that which is pleasing to you and enjoy, uh, as Paul said in Philippians, to be able to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'll say rejoice. Uh, Father, I do pray your spirit is at work. You are alive and well. Christ is at, at your right hand. God, I pray that you would work in the heart of anyone here today who has not put their faith and trust in Jesus, that they would know and hear of the gospel that Christ lived a sinless life, died on the cross to pay for our sin, that they would hear the offer given to repent and believe, that, Lord, you would open their eyes, open their ears, give them a new heart, that they would forsake what is behind 
and embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And may we uh, rejoice with them in that today. God, I pray that you would do this work in the heart of anyone here who doesn't know Jesus as Savior, that they might be the next people that we see professing their faith in Jesus here and joining together with us in the church. Lord, use us in these ways. Thank you for using us in these ways. And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together.